Let me set the stage for the work that I'm going to talk about today by way of a, a quick hypothetical example. So suppose that we're interested in the effect of colonoscopy, that's the treatment variable, and it's D in this diagram at the top of the slide, um, the effect of colonoscopy on colorectal cancer, the outcome, Y, but we can't assess this effect using standard methods because there are high rates of noncompliance, and noncompliance could introduce unmeasured confounding for the effect of treatment on the outcome um, by unmeasured confounders denoted by U in this diagram. So, for example, you might be health-seeking behaviors, or I guess in this case, health-avoiding behaviors. Um, but luckily, in this hypothetical example, um, the treatment assignment, which is denoted by Z, is unconfounded with the outcome, at least conditional and measured covariates, and therefore we can use Z as an instrument for the treatment in order to recover the causal effect of colonoscopy on colorectal cancer. So let's say that the measured confounders denoted by X include um, age, family history, BMI, smoking history, and the results of a, a test called fecal occult bleeding test. Um, so in order to, to set the stage for the causal effects that we're going to be interested in, we need to define two different kinds of counterfactuals. So I'm denoting um, by Y sub Z comma D the outcome, the counterfactual or potential outcome that we would have observed if possibly contrary to fact we could have uh, forced somebody to have treatment value little z or instrument value little z and treatment value little d. And then d sub z is the counterfactual or potential treatment that we would have observed if possibly contrary to fact again we could have forced somebody to have instrument value little z. Moving on to slide three, um, in instrumental variable settings like this, we can think of the population as being divided into four compliance classes. So always takers take treatment regardless of what their treatment assignment tells them to do. Never takers do not take treatment regardless of what the, the assignment tells them to do. Compliers do what they're told to do, so their treatment value is equal to their instrument value or their assignment value and defiers do the opposite of what they're told to do. So their treatment value is always equal to um, one minus their instrument value. Of course, um, membership in these classes can't actually be observed because we only observe each subject under one instrument assignment, either Z equals zero or Z equals one, but we are never able to observe a, an individual under both instrument assignments. So these are our latent classes. All right, on slide four now, um, the local average treatment effect, or LATE, is defined as the effect of treatment among compliers. So the effect of treatment among those people whose treatment we can hope to affect via the instrument. So these are the people who do, who take treatment when they're assigned to it and do not take treatment when they're not assigned to it. And today we're going to talk about the LATE curve, that is, um, late as a function of V, where V here is a subset of X, and X, remember, are the measured confounders for the effect of Z on Y. Uh, so what is this effect, late, and why do we care about it? So I'll argue that it's an important effect for clinical decision making um, or for defining interventions more generally. So late is in general what a doctor cares about when there's a patient standing right in front of him and he has to decide whether to recommend colonoscopy or not. So the doctor can never know whether the patient in front of him is a complier or not, but he knows that if the patient is a complier, then the local average treatment effect is the effect that his recommendation will have. And if the patient is not a complier, um, then it doesn't matter what he says. Actually, I should issue a caveat here that if there were, I'm going to assume, and I haven't said it yet, but I'm going to assume that there are no defiers in the population. So if there were defiers, then the doctor would have a much more complicated um, decision-making process. So estimating the dependence of late on covariates enables doctors to take treatment effect heterogeneity into account um, in when 
deciding what the effect of treatment assignment will be on a particular patient. And we're interested in late as a function of V, which is a subset of the entire covariate set, because, um, well, let me give you a little example. So suppose that all of our data about the relationship between colonoscopy and colorectal cancer are collected from a really top-notch university research hospital. And doctors at this world-class hospital are able to base their colonoscopy prescribing behavior on all of the covariates that I mentioned above. But in most healthcare settings, doctors might not have access to fecal alcohol bleeding tests. They might not have access to full patient histories. So in, in more resource-poor settings, doctors have to decide whether or not to recommend colonoscopy based only on observing, for example, say, smoking history and BMI or whatever subset of the, the full set of confounders is available to them in their less resourceful setting. So late of, as a function of V, where V is exactly the subset of covariates that the doctors have access to, is the effective interest in this case. Um, and then I just want to mention that another advantage of late as a function of V over late as a function of X, the full covariate, vector is that when X is high dimensional, we might be able to estimate late V or to model late V with fewer or possibly even no parametric assumptions for V, choosing V to be a low dimensional subset of X. Our goal today is going to be to model late V as robustly as possible. And in particular, I'm going to propose a doubly robust estimating procedure for late V. slide five now. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit more background shortly. And then in order to minimize the technical details and overwhelming notation, I'm going to walk through a, a very simplified version of our problem first. Um, and the simplified version is estimating late of x, so late as a function of the full covariate vector. And this will allow me to gloss over some of the complicated details of our contribution, which was to estimate late V, um, but I assure anyone interested that all of the details are in the paper and the paper supplement. So after describing our model for late as a function of V, I'll briefly describe a data analysis that we performed, um, and then I'll end with a really neat and surprising connection between our model for the local average treatment effect and a really different class of models that had been previously described in the literature. Okay, slide six now. Um, interest in the local average treatment effect dates back to the mid-1990s, and since then there's been considerable activity around developing better and more general methods for estimating weight. There have been several proposals for doubly robust estimation of the marginal local average treatment effect. So that's the local average treatment effect marginalized over X, over all the covariates. Uh, and there have also been several proposals for the estimation of late as a function of X, all of the, the, all of the confounders of, of the instrument outcome relationship. And I just want to point out that the marginal late and late as a function of X are special cases of late as a function of V. So taking V to be the null set and V to be the full set X gives us those special cases. As far as we're aware, um, ours is the first paper that directly addresses estimation of late as a function of V when V is a strict and non-empty subset of X. Um, so you'll see in the, the final part of this talk that um, there's a, a paper by Tan in 2010 that developed methods for a, a different, a totally different estimand, but because of this neat connection between these two models, it, his methods can actually be used to estimate late V and to do it doubly robustly. Um, but our models are different, and our method has the advantage of avoiding model incompatibility, and also it has some advantages in terms of interpretability of the parameterization of, of the late curve. But on the flip side, his method has the advantage of um, requiring more intuitive nuisance models, so nuisance models that might be easier and, and more intuitive to parameterize and model. Okay, so 
Um, let's jump into the, the relatively simple problem of estimating late as a function of x. Um, in order for the late curve to be identifiable, we need to make several assumptions. So we're going to assume um, the exclusion restriction, which says that there's no direct effect of Z on Y. So any effect of the instrument on the outcome is through the treatment. So the instrument sort of toggles the treatment and the treatment affects the outcome, but the treatment doesn't affect the outcome directly. The instrumentation assumption just says that Z does in fact toggle D, so the instrument does have an effect on the treatment. Um, if it didn't, we couldn't possibly use it to identify the effect of the treatment. And it has to hold within all levels of the covariance. Um, randomization says that Z, the relationship between the instrument and the treatment is unconfounded given the measured covariance X and the relationship between the instrument and the outcome is also unconfounded given the measured covariance x. The monotonicity assumption um, is crucial for identifying late the local average treatment effect, um, and this is the assumption that there are no defiers in the population. So the population is comprised of always takers, never takers, and compliers, but there are no sort of perverse people who do exactly the opposite of what they're told to do. The positivity assumption is just that the support of covariance is the same among those with instrument value one and instrument value zero. And the consistency assumption says that the observed outcome and the observed, the observed outcome is the counterfactual outcome um, evaluated at the observed treatment value and that the observed treatment value is the counterfactual treatment value evaluated at the observed instrument. Um, so slide nine now. Under these assumptions, the local average treatment effect um, is identified by the instrumental variable S demand, which is given here. Slide 10. So ideally, we would like to be able to estimate the local average treatment effect under a model that makes no assumptions beyond what I've just stated. So those identifying assumptions plus a parametric model for um, the, the causal effect of interest, the late curve. But unfortunately, when X is high dimensional, we'll need to make additional modeling assumptions. So the goal here is to reduce those additional modeling assumptions and to build up robustness to misspecification of those nuisance models. Um, so first I'll explain sort of this ideal semi-parametric model that makes no additional modeling assumptions beyond the parametric model for X, and then I'll explain the additional um, nuisance models that we'll need to estimate as well. Slide 11. The Identifying instrumental variable assumptions imply these four inequality constraints here. And you'll notice that, um, or take my word for it, but I hope it's a little bit intuitive, that these inequality constraints contain no information about the local average treatment effect. Um, and our, our model for the local average treatment effect implies that the the parametric model, so I'm, I'm denoting by M of X indexed by beta, a parametric model for our causal effective interest, the late curve. Um, when we posit this parametric model for the late curve, this just implies the observed data restriction that the parametric model is equal to the IVS demand, the observed data functional that gives us the late curve. So since the, the four inequality constraints don't contain any information about beta. Estimation of beta, estimation of our parameter of interest, the parameter indexing our model for late, is informed solely by this red equality constraint. So this is on slide 12. When Z is binary, which we'll assume throughout, this equality constraint is equivalent to a covariance restriction given here. So this says that the covariance of y minus our 
model for late times D, and Z is equal to zero conditional on X. So throughout, for convenience, I'm going to call this quantity Y minus our model times D um, H of beta. So what you have to remember is just that H of beta is a functional of Y, X, and D, and it's indexed by the parameter beta. Uh, slide 14 now. Because inference about beta is determined solely by this conditional moment restriction, it's, it's very easy to see that the set of gradients for beta, that is, the collection of functionals of the observed data that have mean zero at the true beta, is given here. Um, in parentheses, we have the empirical covariance of H of beta and Z. And then out front, we multiply by arbitrary functions of x because the covariance restriction holds conditional on x. So this is, a, this is this just taking the covariance restriction and turning it into a collection of functionals that have mean zero at the true beta. Slide 15. There are two conditional expectations inside of these gradient expressions. So we have the conditional expectation of H of beta given X and the conditional expectation of the instrument given X. When X is high dimensional, we can't estimate beta by simply plugging in non-parametric estimators of these conditional expectations because the non-parametric estimators won't converge fast enough. So we'll need to, to posit two additional nuisance models one for each of the conditional expectations. Um, so this first one in red is the instrument propensity score. That's the, the probability of the instrument given X. And to estimate this nuisance model, we just fit any old logistic model. Estimating the conditional expectation of H of beta, the blue nuisance model, is a little bit harder because H of beta depends on the unknown parameter beta. but we can get around this by solving for eta as a function of beta um, and then solving, um, estimating eta and beta jointly. Slide 17. So now we have our doubly robust estimating equations for beta. The solution to these, I've just taken the, the gradients and set them equal to zero and plugged in the nuisance models and we'll solve these for beta, and that gives us a, a, a solution that it will be consistent and asymptotically normal for the true beta if either one of these true, two nuisance models is correctly specified. And to see that you only need one out of the two to be correctly specified, recall that these equations are based on a covariance restriction, and the conditional covariance between H of beta and Z will be zero as long as we have correctly centered either one of the two at its true mean. Um, we, or both, um, but we don't need to center both of them at their true mean. We can center one or the other, and the equations will still be zero at the true beta. So if both of the nuisance models are correctly specified, and for a particular choice of Q, what we call Q after the optimal Q, uh, the solution to these estimating equations asymptotically achieves the semi-parametric efficiency bound in the model in which the instrument propensity score model is correctly specified. So um, we are, we've achieved robustness for these nuisance models. Ideally, we wouldn't want to posit any nuisance models, but if X is high dimensional, we have to. And so we've achieved some robustness in that we only require one or the other to be correct. So if we're, you know, we, we do the best we can, we try to estimate both of these nuisance models as well as we can, but if we're unlucky and or moderately lucky and get one right and one wrong, we will still be able to consistently estimate beta, which is the parameter of interest, um, indexing our model for the local average treatment effect as a function of X. All right, slide um, 18. So now I'm going to move on to the similar but slightly less friendly case of estimating late as a function of V, where V is a subset of X. So the, the issue here is that we still need to control for X because X is the, the set of confounders. We need 
um, to condition on X in order for the randomization assumption to hold. So we can't just ignore X and plug in V instead of X. We need to still, in some way, control for all of X, but we want late to be a function only of V. So the identifying assumptions here are exactly the same as they were for late of X, except that the instrumentation assumption now has to hold conditional on V instead of conditional on X. Slide 20, um, late as a function of V is identified in the observed data by the conditional version of the instrumental variable estimand. So this is just the same as the IV estimand that identified late of X, except that both the numerator and the denominator are now expectations conditional on V. And slide 21, just as with late as a function of X, our model, which consists of a parametric model for late of V, so I've, I've sort of, I'm using the same notation, but M is now a parametric model for late of V instead of late of X. So our model consists of a parametric model for late of V and those IV assumptions, and this puts just one equality constraint on the observed data, and this equality constraint is what we'll use to estimate data. Slide 22. So before, um, for when we were dealing with late of X, the equality constraint was equivalent to a really simple, nice, clean, conditional covariance restriction. Now our equality constraint has a much more complicated and le less intuitive form. Um, in fact, it has two forms. So these um, these are just these are algebraically equivalent, um, but they give us two different ways to estimate beta. So the first equivalence here, this middle line on the slide, would let us estimate beta under a nuisance model for the conditional expectation of H of beta, um, because you can see that um, the conditional expectation of H of beta figures in this in this middle line, but the conditional expectation of the instrument is nowhere to be found. Um, and the second equivalence depends on the conditional expectation of the instrument, but not on the conditional expectation of H of beta. So these, putting these together in a, a, an informed way is going to give us a doubly robust estimator. Um, and I won't show it here, but we could also use just this middle line to get consistent estimators of beta using just the nuisance model for the conditional expectation of H of beta, and we could use the bottom line to derive estimators of beta using just the nuisance model for the propensity score, the instrument propensity scores. Slide 23. So we put these two equivalences together, and we get the set of gradients for the true beta. So this is the collection of functionals of the observed data that have mean zero at the true beta. And this collection ranges over arbitrary functions of V. So Q of V, the, the set is plugging in any arbitrary Q of V. Just like before, when X is high dimensional, we can't estimate beta by simply plugging in non-parametric estimators for the, the two conditional expectations because they won't converge fast enough. So again, we'll posit two additional nuisance models. So note that this first nuisance model is just the same as before. It's the instrument propensity scores. Um, but now for the second model, we have to model the expectation of H of beta given both Z and X, whereas before this conditional expectation was conditional only on X. Um, and I'll come back to this in a minute. Slide 25 now. So here we have our doubly robust estimating equations for beta. It's either our model for the conditional expectation of H of beta, or our model for the instrument propensity scores is correctly specified, these estimating equations will be unbiased for beta. They'll give us consistent and asymptotically normal estimates of the true beta. And if both of the nuisance models are correctly specified, and again, for a special choice of the optimal Q of V function, the solution to these equations will attain the semi-parametric efficiency bound in the model in which the, the pi model is correctly specified. Slide 26, um, I just want to make a few notes. So first, it's not entirely straightforward to posit a model for the conditional expectation of H of beta, and that's 
in part because this model has to respect that first observed data restriction equivalence. So jumping back um, very quickly to slide 22, that middle line tells us that the conditional, the difference between the conditional expectations for the two different values of z has to have mean zero given b, which is not a, an entirely intuitive restriction. Um, so in the paper, we give one possible, but not necessarily the optimal modeling strategy to ensure that the, our model for the conditional expectation of each of beta does indeed respect this constraint. Um, second, I want to highlight an advantage of our method, which is that any parametric specifications for these nuisance models are guaranteed to be compatible with any parametric specification of our, our causal effect of interest, the late V curve. And this is roughly because the, the nuisance models are variation independent of the model for late V. So no specification of these models can ever, of the nuisance models can ever conflict with any, um, they, the, the form of the nuisance models doesn't restrict the form of um, late V. And finally, um, to derive the standard errors for our estimated parameters beta hat, um, we can get the asymptotic variance of our estimator using either the standard sandwich estimator or the bootstrap. Okay, now on, um, on slide 27, I want to turn briefly to our data analysis. The question on hand is, what is the causal effect of 401k tax-deferred retirement savings plans on household savings in the U.S.? So these plans were introduced by the government in the 1980s in order to encourage household savings, and they've become very popular, but some economists hypothesize that, um, that participating in a 401k plan doesn't necessarily increase savings so much as replace other modes of savings. And we used data from SIP, that's the Survey of Income and Program Participation, which is a U.S. census data set, um, but, and this data includes 9,725 subjects or households, so they're household reference subjects. The outcome here is net financial assets. The treatment is participation in a 401k plan, um, and the instrument is eligibility to participate in a 401k plan. So there's likely to be a lot of unmeasured confounding for the relationship between participation and um, net financial assets. Assets, for example, financial conser financially conservative people are more likely to both participate and to already have higher assets. Um, or pretreatment preference for saving is another unmeasured confounder. But the eligibility to participate in a 401k plan is determined by employers, and we think that it's plausibly unconfounded with the treatment and the outcome, conditional on the measured covariates that are included in this data set. So those covariates are age, marital status, one for married and zero for unmarried, or other, um, family size, so the number of people in the household, and total household income. It's impossible to participate in a 401k plan without being eligible through one's employer, so there are no defiers and no always takers in this setting. Um, we might have never takers or compliers, but the other two are impossible. And we're interested in this analysis in effect modification by income. So we want to know how does the effect of 401k participation among compliers change with household income? So we estimated late as a function of income, which is, of course, a proper subset of the, the full set of those four measured covariates in this case. Slide 28. Um, so there's a lot going on here, but let me walk you through it. We estimated the parameters of a linear model for late with just an intercept and a slope for income. So that's given in the header of this, this table. Um, and we specified linear models in the covariates X for both of the nuisance models, for the H model and the pi model. 
And we put a power series on income in both of these nuisance models. Um, we, we hypothesized that income would really be the driving um, covariate in all of these models, so we wanted to allow the nuisance models to depend fairly flexibly on income. And we saw for a, a series of different types of estimators. Um, in the first line for both the intercept and the, the income slope, we have the optimal or the efficient doubly robust estimator. We also have um, an inefficient but still doubly robust estimator, a non-doubly robust estimator that's based solely on the instrument propensity score nuisance model, but not on the expected value of H of beta, and then an estimator called, um, so that's the one that I just described as beta sub IPW for instrument propensity weights, um, and the and then beta sub reg is that's for regression, the outcome regression model. That's a non W robust estimator based on the expected value of H of beta, but not on the propensity, the instrument propensity model. So you can see here um, that there's some instability in the estimate in the estimates when the power on income is small, but when the, the power on income is sufficiently large, so for the columns for the power four and eight, uh, things generally stabilize more or less. Um, slide 29, the, the two doubly robust estimators give us very similar point estimates, and this is consistent with our having approximately correctly specified the late of income model. Um, as just a, a linear model with the intercept and the, the slope for income. So if our model for late was misspecified, we would expect these two different doubly robust estimators to have different probability limits. The, the, only, the only case in which they should have the same probability limit is if we're actually estimating the true late curve. Slide 30. Um, you can see that the, the coefficient on income here is approximately 330, and this suggests that 401k plans, um, participating in a 401k plan has a larger effect on the savings of a family with a higher income. So specifically, for every additional $1,000 in family income, 401k plan participation is expected to increase household savings by about $330. And slide 31. As expected, we see that the doubly robust estimator with the optimal Q function has the smallest standard errors. So this is the, the estimator that is semi-parametrically efficient um, when everything is correctly specified. And there's, of course, no guarantee. In fact, it's quite unlikely that everything is correctly specified here. But we at least our results are consistent with things being approximately correctly specified. Okay, slide 32. Let's now talk really quickly about this nifty and surprising connection between the model that I've just described for estimating the local average treatment effect as a function of V and a very different model that was previously proposed by um, Robbins and Tan. So Robbins and Tan were after a totally different estimate. Instead of the effect of treatment among compliers, they were estimating the effect of treatment among the treated. And it turns out that Estimation procedures under the two different models, theirs for the treatment effect on the treated and ours for the local average treatment effect, are totally identical. So to estimate the ETT under the Robbins-Tan model or to estimate the local average treatment effect under our model, one goes through exactly the same steps. So the Robbins-Tan model for the effective treatment on the treated assumes all of the same IV assumptions as our model, except for monotonicity. They do not rule out the presence of defiers. And they also make an additional assumption, which is no treatment by instrument interaction. So that says that the effective treatment on the treated does not depend on the instrument. And then they posit a parametric model for the effective treatment on the treated. And I'm going to call that the same, I'm going to use the same notation because, um, so that I can show that this model is in fact the same and estimating the parameters of it is the same under our model and under their model. Um, it turns out that under the instrumental variable assumptions, minus monotonicity, so the Robbins-Tan assumptions, 
and the, the no treatment by instrument interaction assumption. The effective treatment on the treated is identified by the IVS demand, just like the local average treatment effect under our model. But this, um, this alone isn't enough to explain why inference is the same under these two different models, because depending on what auxiliary assumptions you make, inference about the same observed data functional can be very different in different models. And furthermore, we can only estimate late when there are no defiers, and we can only estimate the ETT when there's no treatment by instrument interaction, and these are pretty different types of assumptions. Slide 34. So um, we see here that, indeed, the robbins tan model restricts the observed data differently from our model. So remember that in our model, the assumptions imply four inequality constraints only one of which is repeated here. So the top inequality constraint on this slide is new. And on the other hand, the equality constraint is exactly the same, except that now the, um, our, the model, M of V and beta, is a model for the ETT instead of the late. So the bottom line is that even though the two models have different inequality constraints, we've already seen that the inequality constraints don't affect inference about beta, and furthermore, it turns out that there's no way to use the observed data to adjudicate between these two different sets of inequality constraints. To give a sort of philosophical argument for this fact, I'm going to try to convince you that every possible distribution of the observed data is compatible with a, a counterfactual hypothetical world in which the effective treatment on the treated is identical to the local average treatment effect. They're both identified by the IBS demand. And therefore, estimating the effective treatment on the treated using the observed data has to be the same as estimating the local average treatment effect. So this counterfactual world has two properties. First, it has no defiers. And this is necessary because late is only identified when there are no defiers. Second, um, the effective treatment is the same among compliers and among always takers. And this is what we need to ensure that the ETT is the same as the late. So the effective treatment among the treated is a mixture of the effect among compliers and the effect among always takers um, because there are no defiers and never takers are never treated. And um, Miguel Hernan and Jamie Robbins have an argument um, in a, a 2003 paper for why these conditions will not hold in general. Um, they, they argue that the treatment effect should not usually be the same among compliers and always takers. Basically, they argue that these are likely to be different sorts of people, um, and if there's any effect modification, we'd expect the effect to be different in these two subpopulations. But it doesn't actually matter whether the treatment effect is the same for compliers and always takers or not. What matters is just that any data we can ever hope to collect will be compatible with the two groups having the same treatment effect. And as long as the observed data are compatible with this fact, we're free to proceed as if it holds for the purposes of inference using the observed data. So another way of putting this is that untestable assumptions can't possibly influence how we estimate observed data functionals using observed data. And recall that our job here is to estimate the IV estimand, which is an observed data functional. Um, but these untestable assumptions are crucial for determining what causal effect, if any, is identified by that functional. So in some cases, the IV S demand might identify ETT. In other cases, it might identify late. And in other cases, it won't identify any either of those causal effects. And with that, I'll quickly summarize on slide 36. Um, so we proposed a, a new method for estimating late as a function of covariates, where those covariates are allowed to be a subset of the measured confounders that we need to control for. And it turns out that estimation of late under our model is the same as estimation of the effective treatment on the treated under the robbins tan model. Um, in the interest of time, I've omitted a lot of details, so please refer to our paper um, for, among other things, extensions, to the local average treatment effect on the multiplicative scale and also further exploration of the data analysis of the SIP data. Uh, almost all of the references in these slides are included in the paper, but I wanted to note quickly two that are not included there. And then thank you very much. I especially want to thank Dylan for chairing and Judith and everybody at RSS for their help and obviously my co-authors. 
Thank you. Uh, th th thanks, Betsy, for that great presentation. Um, so the, we're now um, the webinar is now open for questions. You can um, press star six to ask a question, um, or you can use the, the Q and A uh, button on the top of the screen. Let me start with uh, a question that was asked through the, the, the Q and A by um, v, v Low. Um, the, the question is that the, the the X or V is a set of confounders. What if you also have effect modifiers E? Could, could your methodology estimate late of E or late of E and V? Huh, that's an excellent question. Um, so if one, the, the sort of easiest answer is that if um, as long as conditioning on E, so X has to be a superset of the confounders. So condition, we need randomization to hold conditional on X, and if randomization holds conditional on X plus E, we can just fold E into X and do everything as we've just done it. Um, on the other hand, it could be the case that um, conditioning on X controls for confounding, but once we add E into the mix, we might actually open some paths through colliders, or you know, we could. It, it, could conceivably be the case that X plus E is no longer a, a sufficient set to control for confounding. And in that case, I honestly don't know. It's an excellent question. Um, I think my, my initial reaction is that we would have to tweak these methods, that there wouldn't be an easy way to handle that situation. Um, but I'd have to give it some thought. Um, we have an, another question asked to the, the Q&A uh, box. Uh, could, could you extend the methodology to personalized medicine, i.e. optimizing the treatment at the individual level? Uh, that's another great question. And I think um, that in sort of vaguely, I, I feel like incorporating individual covariates um, or, you know, a rich set of covariates into the estimation of late is moving towards personalized medicine. Um, but there are lots of complications. So, um, in particular, we don't, you know, to be really personal in your medicine, you'd want to know who's a complier and who's not. I think one of the most important questions for personalized medicine is what to do with non-compliers and how to, what type of instrument can be used to to bring them into the compliance world um, but I do I think you know this does allow for more personalized decision making than just the for example the marginal local average treatment effect which which isn't really personal at all it's, it's marginalized over all of the covariates and this at least lets you take covariates into account when making decisions in a in a medical setting. Um, then, uh, does, does anybody have any any uh, questions from the audience? You, want, you can um, uh, press press star six to unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, let me ask a question I had. Um, I, I wondered about kind of the the, the modeling of um, uh, the, the 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 model you use for the um, the sort of exotic sort of adjusted outcomes the the H of beta. Uh, I think in in your in your data analysis you used a it was saying right a, a polynomial model, and um, I wondered about um, to what extent you could use more sort of semi-parametric or non-parametric methods. Um, for, for example, the, the, the super learner method of uh, developed by Mark Vanderlaan and colleagues that allows you to sort of combine different machine learning models. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I think the, the major downside of our method um, in terms of actual implementation is that 
it's not very intuitive to know what type of model to specify for the conditional expectation of each of theta. That's a weird outcome, and people aren't likely to know what it depends on or what form the covariance should take in the model. Um, and so I don't, I. I don't have a, a super well-informed answer for you, but a priori, I don't see why you couldn't use SuperLearner. The, the problem is just the rate of convergence. You need, you know, there's always a trade-off between um, modeling parsimony and rates of convergence, and we need those nuisance models to converge fast enough um, and to converge in probability. Um, but, so, and I, I think, and again, this isn't super well informed, but I think that will Im entail putting some restrictions on the super learner library. Um, but I think, and I think using using flexible modeling strategies for those weird outcomes is the most promising way to get over that hurdle. The, the, you you just you mentioned that there was some restriction, like you had to sort of the the model. I think of age of beta had to satisfy certain restrictions. Are are those things that are complicated to impose or? Um, they so roughly the restriction. Um, they, I guess yes and no. Um, I think. There, I would guess there are flexible ways to impose those. So you can, um, you could. We we pose them in a pre, we imposed them in a, a fairly restrictive way. So we we used linear models in order to um, ensure we used specially constructed linear models um, to ensure that that restriction on H of on the conditional expectation of H of beta given Z and X holds. Um, I think that you could definitely do it more flexibly than we did, and in particular, you could um, you could fit models flexibly and tweak them post hoc to ensure that they adhere to that restriction, or fit models flexibly and then test whether they adhere to that restriction and only admit them if they did. Um, and I think that is a really important direction to pursue in order to make this method um, more easily implementable, but it's not, it's future work, <laughs> and it's a really great point. This is another question from the question and answer box. Um, by by uh, personal medicine, do you mean investigating Z given X? In other words, how do the covariates affect the decision to treat? Oh, interesting. I was thinking of personalized medicine in terms of how covariates affect late so that, you know, per, when I think of personalized medicine, I think of um, clinical decision-making that is tailored to an individual's characteristics. Um, I think that Z, so, so to study the way personalized medicine is operating now out in the field, we would look at the effect of X on Z exactly. Um, but to develop tools for improving personalized medicine, I think we would look at the effect of covariates on the, the local average treatment effect itself. Um, does, um, does anybody else in, in, in the audience have um, questions they want to ask, um, can, can, can um, you can use star six to unmute yourself. Uh, so we'll, um, ask another another question I had. Um, I, so I, I guess um, one of the big advantages of, of your method over, over previous methods is that it it avoids the um, model incompatibility of, of I guess the the, the model of um, of uh, z given x and of y given x. And I was just wondering if you kind of say a little more about what what the sort of what what what, what do you 
gain from that? Do you do you gain uh, a reduction in invariance, or um, just maybe say, expand a little more on that? Yeah. So um, in some senses, model incompatibility. Well. I guess model incompatibility is only a problem if models are misspecified. So if everything is totally correctly specified, um, you, at least asymptotically, you can't have any incompatibility, um, sort of by definition. But um, so, in some sense, model incompatibility is just a different type of, or you know, a, a way of characterizing model misspecification. And it's not necessarily worse than other misspecifications. So uh, the model for Z given X cannot be incompatible with the, the late model. And the, um, the doubly robust methods that have been previously developed also rely on the instrument propensity score model. So if that model is correctly specified, then we're fine. The issue is if the, the model for H of beta is incorrectly specified. Um, I think the, the, the only practical advantage of model compatibility is that we might, so we've seen um, in a variety of settings that under slight misspecification and even considerable misspecification, if as long as the, the nuisance model, the model for H of beta, has some information about the, the true underlying um, S demand, it can improve efficiency over just the instrument propensity model. And you might have, and I'm speculating here, but you, you might have a greater chance of taking advantage of that extra efficiency um, when there's no possibility of model incompatibility, because if you have specified a model that's incompatible, there's no way that it's going to help you. It will just, you know, you'll be, you'll be in a setting, you'll be in, it'll, you'll be in a setting that's as if you hadn't specified any model except you're also estimating those additional parameters. So if you're sort of, if you specify a model that's incompatible, you can only hurt yourself. Um, if you specify a model that's compatible but misspecified, I think it's an open question and it will depend greatly on the, the nuances of the setting, whether you're helping yourself or not. So it's sort of, it, you're, you're making your model, um, Smaller in the sense that you're 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 giving yourself a, a better chance of helping your estimation, even if you've misspecified that nuisance model. I think, um, but really, the the actual implications will depend a lot on the specific setting.